Hey everyone, welcome to the second existentialism lecture. Um, in the last lecture, I'm not going to go over ex existentialism too much, I'm going to mention a few things, but in the last lecture I went over it a bit on Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche, the German philosopher, the death of God guy, he was the first existentialist we looked at. And I will remind you that existentialism is about personal freedom, personal responsibility. It's a rejection of groups and collectives. And it thrives on this idea that you create your own destiny, you create your own life, you create your own values, and so forth. Uh, and <clears throat> so we looked at Nietzsche's views of kind of rejecting the traditional cultural norms of Western culture, which included not just religion, especially religion, especially Western religion, but also science and philosophy, too. Nietzsche rejected systems that purported to um, put everything together into one neat, coherent whole, and he was motivated by this idea that life isn't driven by rules that are clear, it's driven by the will to power in, in organic beings like humans that try to seek to dominate. So any system that tries to curb that puts a, um, a curb on human nature, which is going to inherently cause problems. So anyways, that was Nietzsche. We're now looking at Simone de Beauvoir, a French philosopher who is also an existentialist, but who is most famous for actually writing about women. And she's one of the first philosophers to kind of look in analytically at a lot of what I've been teaching you in this class and kind of say, wait, there's some problems here with sexism. Right. There's some, and not just in philosophy. She looks back at religion. She looks back at culture. She looks at the culture of her time. And many of the critiques she makes are still applicable today, depending on the culture. Uh, but anyway, she's an existentialist because she places that question of personal freedom and responsibility around the rights of women. And she points out, as we'll see when we go into more depth later, that society puts these restraints on women that uh, uh, prevent them from succeeding in a way that is more diminishing, more controlling than in the way that it puts expectations on men. So she doesn't deny that men are controlled by social norms, but she thinks it's worse for women uh, and it leads them to be what she calls the second sex, as we'll talk about later. So anyways, that's kind of the continuation here of um, ex the existentialist theme we've been talking about. Now, I do want to mention a couple other things that are kind of big in our culture right now. Um, and one is related to the LGBTQ movement. So uh, the idea that women are stereotyped unfairly and that sex is seen as this male-female distinction where men are supposed to be the breadwinners and bring the money home and take care of the household. Uh, sorry, uh, bring and, and pay for the house. Women are supposed to take care of the household and be the... Uh, children's caretakers and the mothers and they're supposed to cook and clean, right? That's the traditional vision that still exists in many cultures. So De Beauvoir was trying to break that down by, by, put it, by, by saying, hey, look, if we have this expectation on women, what happens when you have a woman who's very, who doesn't want to be a housewife, right? She should be able to get outside of that mold without being judged. Now, notice that that is similar, or at least it paves the way intellectually uh, conceptually for the idea of the LGBTQ movement where um, people's freedom in sex is limited in, in, in a similar way where culture has these expectations of this is what a man is, this is what a woman is, this is what you're supposed to do. So in some sense the LGBTQ movement is an extension of that freedom to be who you are, to be what you want to be that De Beauvoir was trying to say regarding gender. Um, it's not a perfect connection. There's lots of other uh, people who have contributed to the LGBTQ movement. I'm not denying that, but existentialists like De Beauvoir who challenged gender norms were clearly one of the precursors. Um, and I myself, as a bisexual male who's experienced gender dysphoria, I, I really connected with um, De Beauvoir's philosophy and the way it connects with the LGBT com LGBTQ community since I consider myself to be a part of that community. Um, Okay, so before we get, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to mention one other thing about what's happening in our, in our current day and age regarding existentialism and uh, uh, the, the topic of the day, so to speak. So there's a lot, ever since the um, Black Lives Matter movement kind of picked up, it's been around for a while, obviously, but ever since it picked up since the death of George Floyd, 
uh, we've seen these other philosophies kind of espoused by not just members of that movement, by members of the academic left. And um, they are rooted in this concept, this, th this theory called postmodernism that I presented to you in the um, course reader in the existentialism chapter, which can be very good. Postmodernism is a form of relativism where it, it sees everything as a perspective or a point of view. And sometimes that's really good because people can, especially those in power, can believe that they're coming from an objective point of view, but really they're coming from a perspective of Western culture or a perspective of power based on their culture. So postmodernism reminds us that everything can seem different if we look at it in a different way. Now the criticism, of course, is that postmodernists tend to also see science as a perspective, right, and reason as a perspective. So that, of course, can get you into trouble because then instead of accepting obviously objective scientific facts, you merely say, well, that's just the point of view of those scientists, right? Um, so I'm not coming down on either side there, as I often don't, but that's just an example of the arguments over postmodernism. But the way postmodernism is, is relevant to our present moment is that critical race theory, which has unfortunately been hijacked by President Trump, uh, ha has, has become, critical race theory has become kind of a founding philosophy of um, members of, some members of the academic left and the political left. Uh, and again, I'm not going to make any judgments on whether that's good or bad, but I will point out the critical race theory is this idea that it's not just power. Remember, Nietzsche says it's all a will to power. We're all after power. Critical race theory refocuses things on race. So it says that it's not just about power dimensions that are kind of keeping some people down and other people up. It, there's a racial dimension. Right? So critical race theory is sort of arguably grew out of postmodernism and um, uses postmodernism as this foundation that we all have a different point of view, but it places race as, uh, uh, as the central source of, of issues. And um, it argues that race needs to be focused on for us to overcome these problems. So anyways, uh, the ideas, what's fascinating about this is that these ideas of postmodernism and critical race theory has been in the academic world for years, many years before this moment, these ideas are now coming out and people are learning about them and they've been there forever. They used to be just relegated to these obscure parts of the academic world, ivory tower debates at UCSD and Yale and Berkeley, and now they're a part of the national debate. So that's just kind of fascinating that philosophy has this power. These philosophies have um, sort of transcended the academic world. Anyways, uh, let me move on to Debois' philosophy. So. What I'm first going to do is go over her general beliefs, um, her general existentialist philosophy, because she has a philosophy just of human nature, of people in general. And then I'll present to you her views of women. And uh, in fact, let me uh, pop this up on the screen while I'm saying this. So the major ideas we're going to look at, her, her general philosophy is sometimes summarized by this phrase, ambiguity. So in contrast to Nietzsche, who thought life is about power, or critical race theorists who think it's about race, the, the fundamental level of analysis for De Beauvoir is ambiguity, lack of clarity. She argues that we never really know what we are. We re never really know what life is. And this causes a lot of pain and suffering, as she'll argue and as we'll see. And then we'll look at the way she traces how humans are conditioned. In other words, how we are raised and taught to believe things. Throughout this class, we've talked about stuff like economic determinism. We've talked about how, with Plato's cave, we talked about how humans are conditioned to be ignorant. But how does that conditioning happen specifically? So De Beauvoir kind of takes us through the stage of a child growing up and becoming um, uh, a man or woman or person uh, and, and that process of, of um, coming out. And that's what we'll look, uh, look at under the topic of human conditioning. And then she's gonna give kind of three central responses that adults tend to give to an ambiguous life. Um, and she'll introduce this concept of authenticity. And she'll say, those responses are typically not authentic. They're not really you. You're, you're basing your actions off some cultural norm that um, you don't have, you would, don't really have to found your life in. And anyways, we'll get there. And then, like I said, we'll finish off with her views of the second sex and the history of women. 
Um, the second sex is basically just her analysis of how women are the second sex and um, how culture uh, reinforces that through societal norms, like I was mentioning earlier. And then the history of women is more like just a question of why did it happen? Why have women been second? Let's look back historically. And she gives some reasons to justify that position. So anyways, those are the major ideals we'll be looking at with De Beauvoir. So she herself was uh, um, lived her philosophy, you know, very similar to Socrates and uh, Epictetus and, and, and uh, Marcus Aurelius and some of the other philosophers we've looked at who really tried, saw a connection between their lived experience and the things they were preaching. So she preached freedom of sexuality. She preached freedom with your life. She preached ex existentialism, personal freedom. And she sought that freedom. Um, she had an open relationship with Jean-Paul Sartre, who was her uh, lifelong sort of boyfriend. Um, they had many other lovers. She was bisexual herself. Uh, she had relationships with women. Um, she flaunted the norms that hemmed everyone else in. Not only did she argue against those norms, but she said, um, I'm going to flaunt them myself. I'll be a living example of, of this. Now, was she perfect? No. And there are some people who have stories about her that um, tell a less than flattering story. But is anybody perfect, right? Is anybody perfect? Um, to a large degree, she lived her philosophy. Now, later in her life, she and Sartre took an interest in social movements, and um, one of her most famous meetings was with che, che Guevara, and you can see down there um, that Sartre is the, in the middle, she is on the left, and Che is on the right. Uh, and they both argued that Che was an example of a fully realized individual, somebody who really, like them, was trying to live his philosophy. Um, and so, anyways, that, that that's the kind of person she was. She... Um, really tried to practice what she preached. Um, she really tried to make change when she could. Okay, so her, um, like I said, her central belief system uh, revolves around this idea of ambiguity. Ambiguity. And the idea, like I said, is that existence is just unclear. We're, we're never really sure what we are. I mean, even as kids, when, as I'll talk about soon, we have some sense of normalcy if we have good parenting, if we have good family life. Um, but even then, we're always jumping from one thing to the next, right? The, the kid on Christmas morning is already bored of his toys in the next couple of days and wants something new. There, we're always missing something. The way De Beauvoir sometimes puts it is that human beings are a lack of something. We're never completely full. We're never, we're never complete like these notes, right? I'm done taking notes here. These are complete. Um, but our lives are not like that. The lives of a human being, it's no matter what you achieve, no matter how much you do, there's always another project. Everybody dies with more projects they could have completed. Even if you think you're going to prove the last theorem, you're going to become the next Einstein, um, and you're going to prove the last theorem, you're going to disprove every scientist on earth before you. Even if you do that, even if you are the next Einstein, there will be another Einstein after you, right? Just as you were in relation to Einstein. Einstein was not the last Einstein. Right? There have been people who have perfected his work, pointed out flaws in his work, and advanced it. So no matter what we do, life is unclear. Life is ambiguous. Uh, I mean, this is what leads people to have midlife crises. They think they're supposed to get married and have kids and have a house with a white picket fence. And they get in that position, they achieve all their dreams, and they're not happy, right? There's something still missing. De Beauvoir says, if you don't appreciate this fact about life, that there will always be something missing, then you're always going to be unhappy. De Beauvoir says that for us to be happy, for us to appreciate life as it is, we have to appreciate and roll with the ambiguity. We have to understand that we're not going to finish every project, that new projects will overtake us in the, in the future. And she says, what we have to do, though, is when we're engaged in a project, whether that's writing an essay or beating a video game or creating a YouTube channel or creating a video blog, whatever it is, enjoy the project you're engaged in. Give it your full attention, but realize that your attention is probably going to shift in the future or you're going to finish that, you're going to move on to something else. There's no last album. There's no final book that you can write. There's always more. So 
one of the ways that this point is sometimes gotten across is that picture you see there in the PowerPoint, which says that existence, it, sorry, which is uh, the duck rabbit. So if you just glance at that picture, you might've seen one or the other. You might've seen, oh, it's a duck, oh, it's a rabbit. But if you look closely, you can realign your perspective so that in one case, it's a duck where the beak is on the left, moving off to the left, and the, the, the duck's eyes are up there looking to the left. And if you look at it another way, it looks like a rabbit where the rabbit's face is to the right and what was previously the duck's beak is now the rabbit's ears, right? So either you can shift your perception, rabbit looking to the right, shift it again, duck looking to the left. Now the crucial thing to see there is that there's no objective right or wrong answer. It's not a duck or a rabbit. Some scientifically minded rational person come in and say, just tell me, what is it? And De Beauvoir would say, it's not, it, it's neither. It's what you decide it is. And so this is a perfect metaphor for De Beauvoir's philosophy because life is ambiguous. It's our decision to see it as we want to see it, according to her and according to most other existentialists. So um, I already kind of answered this question, but let me emphasize it because it's on the PowerPoint. How are rocks different from humans? How are humans different from objects? Objects? Objects are complete, we're a lack. A rock is just a rock. It's not gonna get more or less than what it is um, on its own. Humans, on the other hand, are always a lack. They're always the, the water that is, the, the cup that's half full. We're always filling ourselves up with more, whatever those things are. And so again, for De Beauvoir, this is just the condition of life. Now I wanna point out one other thing here that remember uh, Nietzsche kind of says, uh, life is pointless, and Schopenhauer, the German philosopher before him, said that life was not only pointless, but useless. Like, we shouldn't be here, forget it. Now, I want to point out that De Beauvoir makes the same initial argument. She says, yeah, life is kind of pointless in a way. It's ambiguous. We don't know what it is. But then she jumps to meaning from that. She says, but that's awesome, because we can create meaning from it. Whereas Schopenhauer said, that sucks, it's terrible, it's one bad experience after another, I wish I was never born, it's probably better not to exist. That's what the previous guy, Schopenhauer, the German guy who influenced Nietzsche said. And De Beauvoir says, nope, it's worth it, not only is it worth it, but we can thrive in this situation of ambiguity. So, how does she see conditioning then? So, like I said, she goes through this process of human conditioning. The way she sees it is she says, life begins with what she calls seriousness. Now, she doesn't mean seriousness like the dictionary definition per se, it's connected, but she means an entire perspective where you see the world as being a serious, real place that where everything matters, where your actions have a consequence and morality is very clear, morality is very black and white. Another way to say it is that her idea of seriousness when we come into this world as children it's like a Disney movie. There's a clear bad guy, usually a guy. There's a clear bad person. Um, there's a clear good person, right? There's the good people and there's the bad people. There's a very clearly marked distinction between good and evil. And good always triumphs over evil, right, at the end. So that's the world we're born into. We believe the world is simple. And of course, we're taught that we're the good guys. We're the good people. Um, our parents are the good people, and, and, and those they disagree with are the evil ones, and so forth. And this continues, and De Beauvoir, by the way, didn't give an exact age, right? She's making a philosophy here. She's not making a, sci a direct scientific argument. It could happen at different times for different people. Cracks in this worldview could develop. So what she says happens is that the simplistic, Disney movie-esque, good versus evil distinction gets broken down when we see that the world's messy. So for example, we might have our parents telling us, don't lie. And then we hear our mom on the phone talking to our aunt and she lies. And then we say, but mom, I thought you said you can't lie. And she says, well, but she's going through this and you have to sometimes understand, right? Gives us that bullshit answer of why lying sometimes justified. Or your dad uh, tells you not to smoke and you catch him having a cigarette outside. And he says, well, do as I say, not do as I do, right? And as the child goes through more and more of these experiences where that simplistic black and white worldview is shattered, and by the way, it may not be the parents, it may be your friends, 
you may find that a friend you really liked stole something from you or um, you know, a friend you thought you knew really hates you or something. And the world slowly over time begins to shatter, the world of this simplistic Disney movie. So Debo Voss says, this is, this is how it works. This is what happens. However, when this happens, when that world shatters, the child realizes his freedom. The child realizes their freedom. The child says, wait a minute. If the world isn't this simple black and white thing that I just have to follow the right rules, then I have a responsibility to this world. I can contribute to it. So you sort of move from being a passive recipient of the morality of your parents and the worldview of your parents into a contributor to the world. Uh, you realize your freedom. You have to contribute. You're going to grow up, and, and the more preco uh, precocious child, and eventually everybody, is going to realize, I'm going to be an adult one day. And I'm going to be just like my parents. I'm going to be a complicated human being who has to contribute to this world. Um, I'm going to be part of this moral view that was given to me. Right? So all this starts to dawn on the child, according to Deb Beauvoir. Now the problem is that this could be a mixed blessing. Because for some people, it's as Deb Beauvoir will talk about later, it's awesome. Some people... You know, probably partly for psychological reasons, others having to do with environment, like many things, a combination. Some people love this feeling of freedom. I get to choose. I get to decide what's right and wrong. I get to be the one who does things that are good or bad. I define my morality. However, probably most people, if Marx is right about economic determinism, are afraid of this freedom. They'd prefer the time when things were simple. They prefer the Disney movie. Disney movie is easy. It makes it simple. These are the good guys. These are the bad guys. See, this is what you have to believe. This is who you follow. This is the person you support. This is the person you don't. People aren't complex. The world isn't complex. It's a very simple field of good and evil. So the child becomes afraid of the complexity of the actual world. And this, says de Beauvoir, is what leads people into different paths in their adult lives, which we'll talk about next. But one other point she makes is that this leads people to be nostalgic. Nostalgic just means a longing for the past, wishing that you were a kid again. And I think all of us on some level have this feeling. Uh, I grew up in, um, part of my childhood was spent in Massachusetts and we had a huge backyard. Uh, a lot of yards are like this out there with no back fence that just opened into the forest. And there were these apple trees lining the back of that yard and I remember as a kid going out on the porch at night, uh, in the evening, and seeing the sunset through those apple trees. And it's just, I felt like I was in heaven. And e even when I'm having that memory now, it's just a peaceful, amazing memory. And I'm not, I I'd be lying if I said there weren't some times in my life where I was facing stress or adversity or complication that I didn't want to go back to that time of simplicity. Um, if any of you have ever seen the movie uh, Requiem for a Dream, which is one of the best drug movies ever created, in my opinion. There's lots of good drug movies. Leaving Las Vegas, there's lots of good ones. Transpotting, that's, that's a great one. Uh, and the reason I mention it is that one way people cover up this feeling of nostalgia is with drugs. Right? They want things to be simple. Life is too complex. They don't want to face it. Drugs are a nice stop to that. And there's a point in that movie when Marlon Wayans, who's playing one of the drug addicts, uh, the actor, is his, that's his name, Marlon Wayans, and um, he is dealing with stress and he gets high. And he then has this vision of how when he was four or five years old, he used to climb into his mother's lap and she would comfort him and say, don't worry about all this stuff outside. All you have to do is love your mother. And it was clear that this was a point of nostalgia for the character in the film. Um, and so anyways, I think the director, Darren Onofsky, in that film, Requiem for a Dream, again, is the name of the film, uh, I think the director was representing that idea of that feeling of nostalgia and the way that drugs in particular can cover that up. So anyways, for De Beauvoir, that's how we all come up, more or less. We go through a stage of loss of innocence, and that can lead us into very distinct different life paths, um, depending on our psychology. So, uh, let's take a look at her three responses to ambiguity. 
So first, um, the first response, like I said, is seriousness. So if life is ambiguous, if we don't know what we are, if we're always engaging in new projects, um, what do we do? What, what, how, how do we live our lives? Well, one way is to say, I want to go back to when things were simple, like I was just arguing. I want to go, I'm nostalgic. I want to be, I want to be a kid again, but I want to be an, still be an adult, right? That's the, the perspective of the serious person, says De Beauvoir. Um, a desire to return to that simplistic Disney black and white morality. You want it, like I was just saying with Marlon Wayans, you want to just love your mother. You don't want to worry about anything else. You want to watch cartoons after you come home from school. You want to play with your friend in the playground. You don't want to think about a career. You don't want to think about what are you supposed to do with your money. You want to go back to how things were. And most importantly, you don't want to think about morality. You, you kind of want a moral system to be given to you so you don't have to reflect on every moral decision. You want to know what's right and wrong. So. What De Beauvoir says is, the serious person is somebody who finds that simplicity by joining a belief system that gives it to them. And think about it, belief systems do give you hard and fast rules. Um, from the Buddhist Four Noble Truths to the Christian Ten Commandments, uh, Christianity obviously is heavy with the idea of good versus evil, the devil versus uh, Jesus and God and so forth, and these divine cosmic forces fighting themselves out. Uh, there's a certain comfort in that, knowing that if you're on the part of God, you're on the part of the good guys. You're, you're the good people. So De Beauvoir says people hide and, and, and try to retain, to regain that seriousness they had as a kid, that simplicity by joining a belief system. Now, it's often a religion, but it doesn't have to be a religion. It could be a political party, where, where you also have clearly defined moral rightness and wrongness. An abortion is right, an abortion is wrong. Um, we should have higher taxes, we should have lower taxes. You don't have to think as much about these positions or look at all the evidence, you just fall in line with the belief system that's there, according to De Beauvoir. So the other thing she says about the serious person is that this person claims to have chosen their values. They tend to claim that, yeah, I chose to become a Christian. I chose to become a Buddhist. I chose to become a Muslim. I chose to become a liberal. I chose to become a libertarian. I chose to become a conservative, and so forth. But she says, actually, you didn't really choose. You latched on to the belief system that was closest to you in an effort to regain that seriousness you had as a kid. She says, the serious person chooses his values but pretends that they are objective or real. So in other words, if you ask somebody who is a diehard Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or liberal or conservative, they'll tell you, no, 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 this abortion is wrong, right, if they're conservative typically, or, or no, 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 free choice is right, uh, the right for women to choose, that's the real value, or um, God really exists, uh, or, or no, no, suffering, uh, the dukkha really is a condition of life, if you're a Buddhist. They'll tell you parts of their religion that they clearly chose to believe as though they're objective. Right? They'll pretend that things that they chose to be a part of, that they actually joined that group, they made a choice, whether they are aware of it or not, yet they pretend, oh no, it was just what was objectively true, that's, that's the reason. Uh, so the way De Beauvoir puts it is... It's like a woman who, while reading a love letter, pretends to forget that she sent it to herself. Now let's update that example by saying an email. Right? Let's say you get an email, you send yourself an email about how great you are and you want to date yourself, and then you read it later and you forget, you conveniently forget, you sent it to yourself and you say, oh wow, look how great this is. This is so amazing how this person loves me and I, I'm in love with it. Like, you, you just pretend it's real. And De Beauvoir says the serious person is doing that with the belief system they latch onto. They've latched onto it because it was convenient in their culture. Um, Christianity was nearby or Buddhism was nearby. There were lots of Buddhists in the community, whatever it is. Um, but they ultimately chose to become part of that group. So there's sort of an inauthenticity here. And I mentioned that word before. Authentic and inauthentic in existentialism means not being true to yourself. Right? There's an element of deception where you're not choosing this belief system because it's really objective. Right? You're choosing it because it's convenient and you already chose it before and you want to be a kid again. You want to go back to when things were simple. 
And you're choosing it because this belief system allows you to do that. Again, like I was saying before, it tells you what's right and wrong. It tells you what you should believe and what you shouldn't believe. It makes life easier so it's like you're a kid again. It's the closest thing you can get, says De Beauvoir, to experiencing that nostalgia. Uh, uh, sorry, to um, achieving, to getting past that nostalgia and experiencing that oneness that you felt as a kid. And she also says that people who get too deep into the serious perspective are the ones who become fanatics. They start dying for their causes. They blow themselves up in the name of their cause, or they blow other people up in the name of their cause, which could happen anywhere, right? It could happen with any belief system. Fanatics, in, uh, they believe what they've chosen so readily, so strongly, that it becomes part of who they are. And anyways, uh, needless to say, De Beauvoir does not think this is an authentic path. So what about this? The second thing De Beauvoir says happens is when people are faced with the ambiguity of life, and this relates a bit to Nietzsche, they tend to become nihilistic. And remember, nihilism or nihilism means uh, there's no meaning, right? which often comes in the form of the feeling, but it is a, it can be seen as a belief that life is inherently lacking in meaning. There is nothing objectively true or right or wrong, or it's it's all meaningless. Uh, there's no purpose. So Nietzsche says, this is another response that many people have to ambiguity. And crucially, De Be unlike Nietzsche, De Beauvoir says, it's just as bad as the serious person. It's the same kind of problem, because in with a serious person, you're ignoring the ambiguity of life by replacing it with a belief system. But with a nihilist, you're rejecting every aspect of life, right? Not only are you rejecting the belief system, but you're rejecting yourself. You're rejecting your own ability to create meaning, and you're withdrawing into yourself. So the nihilist, to just stereotype it, is the type of person who lives with their parents at home and plays a lot of World of Warcraft in the basement, right? They, they don't feel connected to things, and they don't think it ultimately matters that much. Um, there's a la there's a withdrawal from life and from responsibility um, again because for them life is laden with this lack of meaning and again let me emphasize De Beauvoir says this is not authentic authenticity this this is not an authentic true approach to life we all face nihilism we all face the threat of nihilism but that doesn't mean it, it's sort of cowardly to succumb to that, to, to move into to yourself that way, and not to say, yeah, life's, life's meaningless and it's ambiguous, but let's move forward from here. Let's, let's try to create our own meaning. Um, so anyways, also an inauthentic approach to the ambiguity of life for De Beauvoir. Now finally, and this also connects with Nietzsche's idea of the overperson, the overman, De Beauvoir says the third common response is, or perhaps less common, the third response to an ambiguous life is the adventurer. And this is the person, this is the kid who loved it that, that I mentioned before, the kid who says, you know what, my parents are messed up, I'm going to be messed up too, I can't wait till I can contribute to this world and do my own thing. Right? This is the adventurer. The adventurer loves that life is ambiguous. They love that they can create their own values. They love that they can choose themselves and choose what they want to do. They love that they're not bound by some simplistic morality. Right? It's, it's a beautiful thing for them. They get to explore life, to explore themselves. So adventurers, um, as it says there in the PowerPoint, they don't take refuge in traditional value systems, but they give themselves values. Right? They create their own lives, their own values, similar to the overman. But unlike the Overman, Nietzsche said the Overman was ultimately, you know, a good thing, an advancement on uh, uh, humanity, a, a, an evolution of human beings intellectually. But De Beauvoir actually still thinks that the adventurer is somewhat inauthentic. And the reason is, is that although the adventurer is correct to reject these other belief systems and authentic in that way, um, they are still dependent on other people for their advancement. They're still dependent on others, and they don't acknowledge that. Right? So you have somebody like Alexander the Great, or Genghis Khan, or these great conquerors of the past, and yes, we, we speak about them in these, these great terms. Well, if you're the winners, on the winner side, you speak about, about them that way, but they're often, you know, valorized. Uh, but where would they be without their military? Right? Where would they be without their men and the people who supported them? 
um, to help them achieve that breakdown in values, to help them achieve the domination of other cultures and so forth. Or you might take a modern example like a famous musician, somebody who has a lot of fans everywhere they go, but where would they be without those fans? Where would they be, be to create their own music and to, and to advance the um, uh, and, and, and to advance the way they do and to break down the value systems and to challenge us if they didn't have such a big fan base? So De Beauvoir says the adventurer is still moving in the right direction because they're rejecting values on some level and they're not you know, going back into the, the simplistic morality, they're not being nihilistic, but they're still missing something because there's still an in, in, inauthenticity in their appreciation of their dependence on others in the world, right? So just to reiterate, uh, De Beauvoir thinks that all three of these responses elicit, express some sort of in, inauthenticity uh, towards an ambiguous life. So that's De Beauvoir's kind of some of her central philosophy, like all the philosophers in this class, it goes beyond that. And if you're interested, I can recommend additional books and articles. Um, she says a lot uh, more than that, but that's kind of encapsulates some of her central views. Let's now turn to her views of women. And before we get there, I, I do want to mention one thing. Uh, I am a man talking about a female philosopher here who's talking about women. So I want to state right out at the beginning my own bias. I will do my best to be objective and just tell you what she said, and I'll be honest where I, I don't understand something. Um, of course, this is true for many of the other philosophers too. Uh, I don't know what it's like to live in ancient Greece or ancient Persia, and I talked about those philosophers. I don't know what it's like to be um, a Buddhist in India uh, thousands of years ago, but I talked about them. So. In talking about anything, um, we're never going to exactly coincide with the experience of someone else. But I think that's especially necessary to lay down as a caveat here, especially as we see a world that's becoming more and more equal in terms of gender relations. And as I mentioned before, more and more uh, traditional social norms are being challenged around the LGBTQ community and so forth. So anyways, I understand I have a bias here, but I'm going to do my best to just give you her philosophy. So her central primary quote that comes from the second sex that is oft cited from her is this quote that says, a woman is not born, but becomes a woman. A woman is not born, but becomes a woman. So if you take that literally, it's just, you know, it's kind of obvious. It's like, well, no, you grow into who you are. You grow into a woman just like a man grows into being a man. But that's not what she really means by that. What she means is that the way that a woman becomes a woman is heavily influenced by social norms and cultural values that push her to be a certain way. They push her to be, they push women to be less assertive, um, to be more uh, um, passive, to uh, wear pink and more delicate. They put, society pushes women to think more about their bodies to think more about their physical makeup, literally makeup sometimes, but earrings, right? They're more, women are more, according to Beauvoir, they're more connected intimately to their bodies than a man would be, um, in her opinion. And so we can definitely see that even today, there are still these norms and they've existed for many years and they go back many years and they still exist in many cultures. Norms like this, like, uh, Men are supposed, the, the, the boys are supposed to fight and wrestle and they're supposed to be outside running in the fields and getting dirty and they're supposed to play with, with toy guns and, toy and vid gun related video games and stuff like that. Women are supposed to wear pink and dresses, they're supposed to want to play with dolls. Uh, again, they're, they're, they're supposed to gossip with each other and laugh and giggle. Right? All of these things are um, not necessarily biological, according to De Beauvoir. They're socially constructed, they're given by society. And the problem is that when women and men break this mold, girls and boys break this mold, they're often criticized. Now again, we've made a lot of progress in terms of LGBTQ and this criticism is happening less and less often. But sometimes people forget that most parts of the world are not like San Francisco, right? In, in this respect, in this, in this idea of inclusiveness towards LGBTQ. There are parts of the world where you literally will be killed instantly, today, as I speak, if you come out as gay. Right? 
there are parts of the world where even being friends with a gay person could put you in jail. Uh, there are parts of our country where coming out as gay could get you completely excommunicated from your family. I've heard this from some of my students, by the way. Um, so I've heard this from friends. So this is not something that Debevoir was wrong about in, in this regard. So anyways, these social norms, according to Debevoir, pushes women to be the second sex. Again, she's not denying that men are equally pushed into roles. And it can be equally harmful for them, especially if you're gay. If you're a gay, feminine man, and your family expects you to be masculine and like women, and you don't, that's going to, and they don't accept homosexuality, right? That's going to be a huge burden on you. Even if you're just a feminine man, but you're heterosexual, that could propose a burden. You don't talk, you don't want to talk about cars and muscle cars and strength and sports. And, you know, maybe you'd rather watch, watch something that tr women traditionally watch, uh, like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy or something. None of that should be a problem, Debevoir says, and I would wholeheartedly agree. Anybody should be able to choose what they want to watch or who they want to be, gender-wise. But Debevoir's point is that um, women in particular are pushed into a role that is secondary. Uh, going back to the time she was alive when there was more of this traditional housewife kind of stuff. So even if a woman gets into a situation, Debevoir says, where... Um, she has been a good housewife, so to speak, but then let's say her man leaves her at the age of 30. They got married early 20s, the man leaves her, or they get divorced. Now it's harder for her to get back into the workforce, unlike a man who could maybe start a new career or uh, go off his previous career. A woman who's been a housewife is sort of relegated to that, and it's hard to get outside of that pattern. So, Devavall, by the way, isn't saying that there's anything wrong inherently, uh, there's anything wrong deeply with being a housewife. It, her point is that society pushes women to that point where they may, even, may not even realize they've been pushed. So Debevoir says women have to be aware of this problem and they have to be able to um, push back against it. And of course she argues society should be aware and uh, she advocates for societies creating greater rights for women in this regard. For Debevoir, culture is a huge determining factor in pointing women where they're supposed to be. A couple other things she says. She points out that unlike a man, a woman's sexuality can, can sometimes be in opposition to her professional career. So a man, in fact, is supposed to have a woman, have a woman. A man is supposed to have a career and then have a wife on the side, right? And if he loses a wife or they get divorced, he can get another wife. But a woman is more encouraged, the way Debevoir puts it, is that her sexual life is in opposition to her existence as a person. So if she wants to have a kid, for example, she's got to go through nine months of pregnancy, obviously. And whether or not her company will support her depends on the company. Some companies have good maternity leave and others don't, depending on the country. But a man never has to deal with that. Obviously, if a good man has a child with a woman, he's going to stick around. But he's still not the one whose body is being changed. He's still not the one whose child grows inside their body. Uh, so for the woman, her sexual life has to, her, her professional life has to be put on hold sexually if she wants a kid, whereas a man's life does not in the same way, according to Debevoir. So Debevoir points out that the world is going to be very different from this perspective, just even based on the way men's and women's bodies are physically different, right? And that may seem like an obvious statement, but when she connects it to work in that way, it kind of illustrates the way that can have a continued effect. This, this shift in perspective can change the way society treats women and men, as it does. But De Beauvoir differs from some modern feminists in the following sense. Because De Beauvoir believes strongly in personal responsibility. Uh, some feminists who have argued, for instance, during the hashtag MeToo movement, there were some feminists who argued for uh, um, personal responsibility from women to some degree, and they were often labeled victim blamers. Uh, I'm not coming down on either side here, uh, but... Debevoir, for some feminists, might be seen as a victim blamer in this particular regard. Despite all she just argued, 
right? All the ways she broke down the barriers of women's uh, lack of power in society. Um, she also says, because she's an existentialist, this is what you have to understand, she's an existentialist. She believes in personal freedom, including women. So she says, look, society has a long way to go to make women more free. Men have a lot of things they can do to help. She's not denying any of that. We can change policy. She's not denying that. But she's also saying women also need to realize and educate themselves, understand what's happened historically to their sex and to overcome it themselves too. So women need to be more, less fearful of breaking traditional gender roles. They need to be less fearful of saying, I don't want to be a housewife. I don't want to be your wife. I want to do that. I want to be a doctor. So she says women need to be more forceful in achieving what they want just as everybody does. It's harder for women, she admits that, because of the social norms, but at the same time, it's women are still responsible to do so, in her opinion. So anyways, that's the way she would, she would make that argument. The way she puts it is, what matters are not biological facts, in other words, whether you're a woman or a man, what matters is how we react to those facts and how society reacts. So again, she's not against social reform to improve women's rights, but she's also not against personal responsibility to make your life better, whoever you are, woman or man, or, or anything. So the last idea we're going to look at from De Beauvoir is uh, um, the history of women in particular. And so... What De Beauvoir does in her book, The Second Sex, where all of this sex stuff comes from that I'm telling you now, is she goes through history and she says, what, just sort of, you know, a scienti scientifically, you might say, rationally, she wants to know, why have women been seen as another? Like, what explains this phenomenon? Why in most cultures, most of the time, has there been a patriarchy? Why have most cultures been patriarchal? There have been a few cultures that are matriarchal. Um, there have been a few cultures that have been more equal. So the Spartans, for example, used to have um, strong, powerful female leaders, warriors. Uh, really fascinating. Um, but those have been the exception. Most cultures have had women dominating, right? Have been women, sorry, male dominant, male dominant cultures. And so De Beauvoir says, well, the first reason for this is kind of obvious. And she says, men are just stronger. And this probably goes back to our early evolution. Men went out and they hunted, you know, just to put it crudely, they hunted the, they hunted the meat, they brought it back. And then women and other tribes people were dependent upon those particular men for the food. So as society started building up and um, getting bigger and stronger and more varied and more and more people and, you know, towns turned into cities, that same dependence continued men continue to control the re they're stronger and they continue to control the resources in that way which leads to the second point because men were stronger and they controlled the resources in most societies from the beginning that means they also controlled the educational resources so they controlled what was written who wrote it most of the time by the way it wasn't even it wasn't just women who couldn't read stuff but most of the common people couldn't there are some cultures that were highly secretive. Uh, I, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe the Maya, the religious class, was very secretive. There were only a select few who could read the writings of the elders and the, um, you know, the astronomers, the equivalent of the astronomers of their time. Uh, most cultures, even if they weren't that secretive, there were only a select few who tended to be men and tended to be high-class men, uh, royal, in fact, men of royalty, who were able to access the resources. So of course women aren't going to aren't going to be able to compete with men if they literally don't have the books that men are reading, right? So this is part of it is that men start off being stronger and then as their dominance continues and humans in general get smarter and they start writing things, men are already in control and they therefore control those resources. Uh, and this is true with things like Greek philosophy, with the Bible, um, with the Quran, right? These, most of these works were written by men of status. Uh, I, I can't remember if I cite this example, maybe somewhere in the reader, but um, many of the famous councils in Christianity were convened where 
because the earth, the Bible as we know it today didn't just appear. Different church fathers had to put the Bible together. And um, one famous council called the Council of Nicaea um, actually had a bunch of, uh, you know, they were white male dominant patriarchal church fathers deciding which books of the Bible would be included and which books would be excluded. And there were many other councils like this, and there were similar situations in other religions. This is exactly what Debevoise is talking about. What counts as education? What counts as knowledge gets determined by men based on the fact that they're controlling these resources and they're literally writing them, right? So uh, that's the second reason women have been seen as the second sex. The third reason takes us back to the victim-blaming counter-argument, though. And, and again, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there are some counters to Debevoise's philosophy here. But Debevoise basically says the third reason that women have been the second sex for so long is that they're complicit. They are content to be the second sex. And to just kind of put it crudely, it's nice, and it doesn't take as much energy or as much effort if you stay at home and wait for the man to produce the goods and bring home the bread, bring home the bacon, so to speak, go out and kill the animal and bring it back to you, go out and get the food and bring you flowers, it's easier to just sit at home and, and say, oh, thank you, and, and um, take care of the housework. Right? It's just easier uh, than going out and getting a degree and um, learning about nuclear physics and becoming a lawyer or whatever. Uh, so De Beauvoir says that part of the blame rests on women themselves who got into the situation where they're second and just stuck with it because it was simple, right? They got into a groove and said, hey, this is kind of cool. I can, you know, this guy's kind of nice to me and yeah, I have these other ambitions, but I'm just going to go with the flow here and uh, go along with what culture has given me. So in other words, going back to the early part of the class, women have been pragmatists in some ways. They've said this is easier, it's more pragmatic, just to go along with the way the cultural norms are. So that's the way she sees it. Now again, I want to emphasize that De Beauvoir says these roles are inauthentic when, they're, when we are playing them out of fear. Right? They, these roles, these gender roles that we're playing are inauthentic when they're done because we feel like we've been forced into them. Uh, but for a woman who who realizes what um, for a woman who realizes what history has done to her gender, but then says, you know what, I I understand this. Maybe maybe she goes to college, gets a degree, understands feminism perfectly well, knows the whole argument, knows everything Debevoise is saying, and says, yeah, I know women have been treated unfairly. Um, we've been treated as the second sex. There are social structures guiding us in that direction. You know what though? I've thought about it, this woman might say, and I still want to be a housewife. Like, this is what I like to do. I like, I'm, first of all, I'm heterosexual, she might say. I like men, and I like uh, this particular man that I'm married to, and I enjoy his company. I like taking care of kids. This is what I want to do. I've made the decision, and this is what I want to do. So for De Beauvoir, it's about women having the choice, right? This is why I think the victim blaming thing is wrong because she's not, she's not blaming women entirely. She's saying there's some historical complicity in this problem. It's mainly a problem of society and men and just history continuing, just the history continuing through inertia. Um, but there is some complicity and women themselves, just like anybody else in a tough situation, they can rise out of it by educating themselves and learning about how to overcome their problem. Now, of course, all this depends, which De Beauvoir does not disagree with, on the educational resources being given to women. But, of course, although we still have problems there, we don't nearly have the same problems that we have had in most of history where women literally, and slaves and poor people, literally couldn't read the stuff that other people could read. In fact, since the advent of the internet, anybody can read anything, and, and that's sort of a beautiful thing. So um, the last thing I'll point out before I uh, sign off here is that there's some interesting um, ways that Debevoise's argument can be applied to um, modern media, right? and, and there's been lots of dissertations and theses and books written on this phenomenon. Uh, I edited a book on The Legend of Zelda, which an excerpt is... Um, from one of the authors is in The End of the Reader. And uh, I love the game Zelda, and uh, which is why I edited the book to begin with. 
Um, but in the uh, chapter that I gave, a couple of my friends who had studied feminist philosophy wrote about some of the tropes and the um, ways that games like Zelda perpetuate the myth of women, as, as de Beauvoir sometimes calls it, um, sort of as secondary, and it continues this idea of the second sex. Uh, you know, some of the first Zelda games, for instance, just take the traditional idea of the woman as a damsel in distress in a castle and you have to rescue her. Mario games do the same thing. So some of the early video games are fascinating because they represent the sexism that was still inherent in the culture even more so than now. Um, and even as games started to move forward and we started to see games like uh, uh, Tomb Raider, the woman was highly sexualized, right? Tomb Raider, I mean, she's a busty, beautiful woman. In, in Tomb Raider, and men, mostly men, are playing it and controlling her, right? So it's not like she's a full-blown um, intellectual woman, right? This isn't, this isn't that much of a step forward, many would argue. Although today, video games are incredible, huge productions with movie crew-like um, crews, m movie crew-type uh, uh, groups producing them. It's sometimes bigger than movie crews. I mean, if you ever beat a video game and you watch the credits, it can go on sometimes for an hour or longer. So anyways, video games have come a long way in terms of sexism, and there's still some problems in the gaming industry, which is largely dominated by men. Um, but it's interesting to see the progression. And even the more recent Zelda games have given more of a role to female characters, and they're not just these, you know, sort of damsel in distress type situations. Uh, so anyways, there's a whole field out there of not just gaming, but media in general, and how certain productions in, in popular media can continue these stereotypes and can continue the oppression of women, so to speak, in a more subtle way. They can continue to make women believe uh, that they're the second sex. And um, that's changing, but it's still a problem.